So to reinforce this idea of using the bracket notation, I'm going to work through an example now where we're going to look at the probability of measuring state A, where A is in fact a more complicated state, at least expressed in the Z basis. And then we're going to have a concrete state for our psi cat, our initial state. So effectively, it's if this is our initial spin state, what is the probability of measuring this spin state? And I've normalized these, but don't worry uh, if you don't understand where the square root of 2 coming from. We'll practice later with normalization of, um, in a separate video, with normalizing these cat states. So I've left some of it up from the past video. We're really now just working through this mechanism. So this probability now, we're going to take our A and we're going to express it in terms of the basis. And it's key that the basis of our our bra and our cat match, right? So if this is all Z or this is all X or all Y, we can use these very simple relationships, but they must all be in the same basis. So here I'm going to use some curly brackets and we have our spin up state and our spin down state. And we would call this a superposition state, and it's what we're doing a lot of because there's nothing else we can do really initially with spin one half. Again, this is the simplest thing we can do, so it will feel not like very much, but later on we're going to build on top of this. We now also express our, our input state, again our initial state, in terms of our basis. So be careful about not dropping all of these scalars, they're important, and notice that now we have an I, that this is going to be complex. Okay, so now what we're going to do is effectively FOIL. We're going to just distribute. So you can see that we have two terms here, we have two terms here, so that's going to give us four total terms. Now if you wanted to, you could factor out that 1 over square root of 2, that's fine. Um, but be careful to not lose the i, right? You can't factor out an i, there's only one i here. So some people are pretty good at doing this out in their head. I encourage you when you're first getting started to not do it out in your head. Actually show your work. When this is the only thing you need to calculate, just show every step. Um, later on, when the calculations are much, much more complicated, kind of doing some intermediate steps in your head is, is totally reasonable. So. Our first um, one, so this is going to be 1, I have 1 over square root of 2 times 1 over square root of 2, which is 1 over 2, and I have a plus with a plus. And then my second one, I'll do it this way, is going to be 1 over square root of 2 times i over square root of 2, so that's i over 2, and now I have a plus with a minus. Then my third one, I'll do these, is going to be again 1 over square root of 2 times itself, so 1 over 2 minus with a plus. And then last is this one. You don't have to draw these curves, I'm just trying to do that to make it more clear what I'm doing, is then i over 2, and we have a minus with a minus, and don't forget that square. So now again, we look at this table, and we see that this is going to equal 1, this is going to equal 0, Right, any time you have a plus with a minus, it's zero. Plus with plus is one. So our probability then, I now just have one half plus zero, so I'll explicitly write that out, plus zero, and then plus i over two. Quantity squared. Now this is where we have to remember that this isn't just magnitude, this is that complex conjugate magnitude. So if what, let me just write that out a little more simply, we have, and I'll actually factor this, 1 plus i squared. So what we can do is now pull out that 1 half and square it, right? So I've kind of pulled this 1 half out and left it squared, and now I'm left with 1 plus i squared. So what is one half squared? Well, that is one fourth. What is this? So now this is a little bit tricky if you're not used to working with complex numbers. Again, what we need to do is take its complex conjugate and multiply it by itself. 
And so its complex conjugate is 1 minus i multiplied by 1 plus i. Okay? So that's what this whole thing becomes. So I have very much run out of space on the board. Um, sorry, so I'll move back up here. So again, this 1 half squared gave me a factor of 1 quarter. And then this 1 plus i magnitude squared, first I have the complex conjugate of 1 minus i. Then I have itself, which is 1 plus i. So in this case then, we again can think about foiling this out. We have four terms. We have 1 plus i and then minus i. And then this last term is i times i is negative 1 with another negative 1, so plus 1. So notice that these two equal 0 because they cancel and then they're left with 2. So this probability is 1 quarter times 1 plus 1 is 2, which is 1 half. So now, this is important to do a quick check. We expect our probability to be a real number between 0 and 1. We got 1 half. That's good. That's a real number between 0 and 1. If you get a negative number, you have a problem. If you have a number greater than 1, you have a problem. If you have a complex number, you, or an imaginary number, you have a problem. So all of those things would indicate that you've made some mistake here. And in fact, learning to work with this Dirac notation and using these properties of our bras and our cats, that's usually not the tricky part. Where students start to struggle is they drop squares, they drop factors of two, they pull things out, forget to square it. It's usually the kind of arithmetic and algebra they get people. So what we've done here, to come back to the beginning, is we've found that there's a 50% probability that when we start with this initial state, we would measure this final state. Where is the other 50%? Well, that gets a little more complicated, but the answer is there would be a state orthogonal to this that would be the other 50% probability of measurement. But usually, when we're thinking about quantum systems, we can just think about one at a time.